All right, everyone, thanks for joining us for another Trap House podcast. Great guest today. Mike Sells is back with us. Uh, a month or two ago, we had him on. Uh, the response was great from the public. Great storyteller. Shared a lot about, you know, his life as a trapper, game warden, a veteran. He's a writer. Big part of the Fur Takers of America. Uh, the list goes on. So, uh, yeah, so... Go back, go back and see if you can find that episode and, and check it out. And uh, pleased to have him on again to share some more stories. But uh, there's a couple announcements I want to make first before we roll the sponsors. Um, you know, it's getting that point of the year where people have been out trapping and they're starting to collect their fur, pitting their fur up. Um, if you're here local in central Indiana or, or you know, or even if you want to make the drive, we have our Fur Takers of America Chapter 7B fur sale coming up on March 4th. That's the first Saturday in March. Uh, so keep that in mind. That's in, in uh, Columbus, Indiana at the fairgrounds. We also got to mention the new Trap House Podcast t-shirts. They're available at HoosierTrapperSupply.com. Uh, they're slick. They're nice. They're clean cut. Very comfortable shirts. So check it out. They're on the homepage hoosiertrappersupply.com and we also got to give it up to all the other sponsors of the show top lot stretcher company check out their website top lot stretcher co.com j3 outdoors maker of the hags bracket they're j3o.com uh, they also have the trap line coffee out now great coffee they got a couple different blends there to choose from so check them out then we also have weeby knives weeby knives.com they got a lot of different knives to choose from whether you're fleshing or skinning in the field, they got a fillet knife. Uh, really nice website, so get on there and grab what you need. So, all right, let's go talk to Mike. All right, one last thing I should probably mention about this particular episode: um, we had an audio issue on mine and Charlie's end. Luckily, we don't talk nearly as much, um, and Mike does all the storytelling and talking for the most part. So, bear with us with that. I'm going to clean it up the best I can. Um, so d don't worry. It's not on your end. Your your stereo is not messing up on you. It, it was an issue on our end, and we're going to get it taken care of, and hopefully we won't have any issues like this in the future. So enjoy the show, and we'll catch you next time. So, I'll give you a few game warden stories tonight. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it was the first time around. It was great to have you on and just to talk talk some more trapping and stories, you know. So for those of you listening to this episode, you didn't listen to the last episode. They're not necessarily dependent on each other, but this episode would definitely mean more if you listen, go back and listen to the first one with Mike. So yes. I'm, I'm just going to put that out there. But. Yeah, the first one, I pretty well gave a little background of how I got started trapping. Yeah, and I guess I got long-winded and continued <laughs> clear up to about where I'm at now. <laughs> Mike, we, we were just we were just talking with it. You were on, um, Mark Steck came with you last year. He's the one that, uh, Dakota Line, it has the Weeby Trap Line Adventures right. on uh, the Pursuit yeah. Channel. And, Great and, guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, like I was telling you, he rode around with us in Arkansas um, as well last year, and it, we've had several people mention that. And, and uh, as I was just telling you, we one of the common questions is if Mark is like that in real life or if he, or or whatever. <laughs> and well, he, he I, could, I could tell you a really funny story about Mark. Okay, when he left here, when he left here after filming me on the marsh trapping muskrats, he seemed a little discombobulated. And he'd lost his billfold before he even got out of the driveway. And he's out <laughs> rustling around in his in his van. And I thought he was gone. I thought he was leaving. I'm getting stuff out of my out of my truck truck. And pretty soon I walked over to him and I said, Mark, you look like you're looking for something. He said, Yeah, I can't find my billfold. He said, Did I leave it down on the bed stand last night down in that spare bedroom? I said, I'll go look. So I went and looked and it wasn't there. And I came up and 
and went out and he's still rustling around. And uh, I said, when was the last time you remember? And he said, well, I can't remember. And I said, well, let me look in my truck because maybe you look, maybe you lost it riding in my truck. So I went and I looked like there was nothing on the seat and, and nothing in the back seat. So I walked back to him and I said, I don't see it there. And I said, can't you remember? Well, he said, I, he said, maybe I took it out of my pocket before we got to the marsh. So I walked back and looked and I looked underneath my seat and sure enough, there it was. So I found his billfold and then he takes off. Well, the next day, and I'm not real good at checking my voicemails on my uh, cell phone. And I didn't, I didn't look at my cell phone the rest of that day. The next day I thought, just about time I pulled into the marsh. No, it was before I left in the morning, I checked and I saw I had a message from Mark. And uh, he said, Mike, we should, it was bad luck for us to be talking about our heart problems because I didn't make it home. He said, I'm in a hospital in Cedar Rapids. And he didn't tell me where. And so I tried to call him back. He, he didn't pick up the phone. So I thought, well, there's nothing I can do right now. I don't know which hospital is in. So I got to go check my traps. So I went out to the marsh, checked my traps. And if, when I got there, I tried calling him again, no answer. So when I got off the off the marsh, I tried him again, no answer. Drove home, tried him again, no answer. So then I know there's only three hospitals in Cedar Rapids. So I called each one of those hospitals. And I said, I'm looking to see if you have a patient there by the name of Mark Steck from South Dakota. Nope, nope, nope. All three of them told me nope. So, uh, but one of them said, well, we've got another one of our hospitals, it was Mercy, Mercy One. We've got another one in, in Iowa City. Maybe he didn't make it to Cedar Rapids. Maybe he only made it to Iowa City. So I called Iowa City, nope. So now I'm beside myself. So I, I <laughs> anyway, so I called back to Cedar Rapids. No, somehow, somehow I got in touch with him. I called him and he finally answered. And I said, Mark, which hospital are you in? And he said, I don't know, but he said on the wall, it says Mercy One. Well, Mercy One is in Cedar Rapids, but there's a branch in Iowa City. Well, I'd called Iowa City, he wasn't there. So I called back to Cedar Rapids and I was gonna chew out the operator because he was there, you know, and <laughs> they told me he wasn't. So I called there and I got a different operator and I told him the story and they said, he's not here. But we've got another branch at Cedar Falls, Iowa, another 90 miles up the road. Maybe he made it that far. So they connected me directly to there. I, call, I called there and, and I said, you have a Mark Steck from South Dakota? Yep. <laughs> so they connected me to his room. Yeah, and I said, Mark, I said, you're not in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. You're in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Oh, heck, he said, I better call my wife because she's on her way to Cedar Rapids. <laughs> to pick him up. <laughs> what the deal? Anyway, that was that's my funny story about Mark. <laughs> well, and clearly yeah, he's, anyway. he got through that and he's doing much better. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've been trapping. So you've been trapping and you were sharing with me. If you could just go ahead and you just got back oh. from uh a fur sale. Yeah, Could well, share with us kind of what you were seeing there, price wise, and how it went, and that sort uh, of thing. First, yeah, first of all, let me tell you, uh, I didn't, I didn't start trapping early, like you know, at the start of the season. I knew the prices were going to be low. Of course, gas prices were high, so uh, I mainly wanted to target beaver, and and I wanted to wait till after Thanksgiving. And our season opens the first weekend in, in November. So I, I actually did not start trapping until uh, just after the first of December. But it was a creek west of town, several miles west of town, that had a nice big beaver dam in it. And I got in touch with the landowner. And he told me, yeah, you can, you can trap that. But he said, I don't want you to, uh, 
He said, I don't want you driving through the field along the creek unless it's frozen or dry. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll just park up at the bridge and I'll walk, you know, until it is dry or frozen. <laughs> anyway, so the first day I load up some traps and, and uh, backpack and, and I go and I park at the bridge and I walk about half a mile to the dam and just scouting. And I could see a good place right at the dam where I could make a set or two. And then I, I worked further up the creek and yeah, all together was about half to three quarters of a mile. Well, I had it in my mind I can make two foot trap sets and a conner bear, 330 conner bear. So I walked back to the truck, I got what I needed, and I made three sets. The next day, it is still uh, wet out. And uh, so I take off to check those three traps, and I got two big adult beavers at the farthest you can go. Well, thankfully it was warm. It was like close to 40 degrees. The steep bank, I got those two beaver up the bank and I skinned them out on the bank because no way I can carry them. I got a little bit of a heart problem. So I don't want to overdo it. I don't want somebody to have to find me out there, of course. So I skinned those beaver on the bank. And so then I just had to carry out the pelts. Well, that worked out fine. Well, then the next day, uh, I ended up with a, a medium size, a large medium beaver. Uh, so I was able to throw that in my pack basket and carry it out. So then the next day, I've got two more adult beavers. Uh, only thing is, uh, there ain't no way I'm going to carry them. And it had been frozen now. Uh, that field was frozen. So I thought, well, I'm going to drive. So I drove and I, and I got those two beaver. Anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up in a little bit over a week. I caught nine beaver and three otters. Oh, and yes. three really nice big otters, big adult otters, nice ones. And my my wife went with me a couple of days and, and filmed some of that. And <laughs> anyway, my wife traps and she traps here at our property and we've got a quick run to our property. And every year she traps down here and she does pretty good. In Iowa, a landowner does not need a license to trap on your own property. So she doesn't have a trapping license. Anyway, so here now with where I'm trapping, she goes with me and she's taking pictures. But <coughs> one of those otters, I threw up the bank and she picked it up and carried it up and put it in my pickup. Well, I had two otters in one day. And the second otter, uh, she carried that up to my pickup also. Well, when, we're, when we left that day and we're driving down the road, she looks at me and she says, if a game warden would have come along and seen me carrying those otters, could have I got a ticket? And I said, well, it'd be a pretty poor ticket. But technically, yes, you could have got a ticket because you don't have a license. Right. <laughs> so, so, so we went and we bought her a lifetime uh, for, for harvester's license. So now we don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So then I got thinking, well, if she's with me uh, and if she actually, she's actually going to be, she's not going to be running no traps where I do, but um, next thing she needs tags. You got to have a tag for everybody that's running traps, got to have tags on it. So I just recently ordered her some tags. So in the future, now she's got her lifetime for her with her license and We'll have tags, her tags and my tags on any traps that we've had. Now, back to the first sale. The Iowa Trappers Association, we have a first sale every year, the first Saturday in January, and it's held at Boone, Iowa, at the fairgrounds at Boone, the first Saturday in January. Anyway, uh, so I took those beaver and otter, and I had a few muskrats and some possums and I had some coon, uh, nothing, nothing really great. Uh, I had a bunch of casters that I thought I wanted to sell, but I went out with another trapper the night before. He and his wife and my wife and I, we had supper and he was telling that the caster prices had dropped dramatically. So I thought, I'm not even gonna sell them. I'll just wait till it goes back up. Yeah. But anyway, the, the uh, 
there was one lot of there was a lot there was a lot of fur there. But just to give you an example of how low Coon is, uh, there was a lot of almost a hundred uh, large coon, green. They weren't put up; they just skinned. Uh, about a hundred went across the table, and they brought a dollar each. So, yeah. yeah. So I had I had two large coon. Uh, and the only reason I kept them was I got them in middle of January last year. And so well furred, even though they weren't big, they, were, they, they measured large, but I just couldn't do anything with them. So I, I wasn't going to throw them away. Anyway, so I get a buck a piece off. <laughs> now, what they really wanted was uh, 3X and above. And I had... Uh, the best I got was for three X and I got $4 a piece out of my three X. So in two, two X, I got $3. So coon prices were not really good. Uh, the, the, the good things were I did get $29 a piece out of my otters and I was expecting 25. Yeah. So I got more than I expected. Uh, my beaver uh, I had three large mediums that brought $10 a piece, and I had uh, four large, uh, actually extra large, and they were, um, they brought $19.50 a piece, and the blankets all brought $21 a piece. So that was pretty good. Yeah. But the shining star of the whole sale there was a lot of skunks there, and the put up skunks. The guys that put them up and left the feet on, they all got over twenty dollars for them. Nice skunks. Yeah. Yep. So that was a lot more than than I was expecting for skunks. I didn't have any. Yeah. Yeah. That but, nov you know, that novelty market's pretty good on on skunks. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's a couple of taxidermists in, in Iowa. Taxidermists can buy fur. Mm -hmm. So you know, a couple of taxidermists there that were buying fur. Mm -hmm. And they might have had fur buyer's license too. I don't know, but uh, they, they are taxidermists. Anyway, so that sale is over for this year. Was was there any interest in um, red foxes or coyotes or anything? I mean, any of those? Red, red fox were not bringing very much. They're pretty poor. Coyotes, I saw a lot of put up coyotes bring seven and eight dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and, and in. Yeah. in in relative terms, Mike, you know, your coon are considered some of the best in the country. So that puts our, these coon out east here, mm -hmm. basically. Those dollar piece you got are, are a quarter. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> you know, it, it puts those yeah. at a pretty low value, you know, so. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you don't have at least a 2X coon, you're not going to get anything for it. Right. So that's just, that's just the way it is right now, you know. I've been trapping, this is my 63rd year of trapping. Mm -hmm. And when I started, the prices were low. But just like, it's just historical with the fur market, it goes up and down and up yep. and down and up and down. The best I've ever got, well, the first year I was trapping, I got 35 cents for my muskrats. And, and then they went up a little bit. I remember uh, in 1969, I had several hundred muskrats and uh, and another guy close to me he had a couple hundred and he sold them about a week before I did to a different buyer and he told me he said he got 75 cents a piece for them so that's what I was expecting well I took mine to Hank Springer in Waterloo Iowa and I ended up 90 cents a piece for him so I thought I did pretty good yeah. that was in 69 yeah well uh, the best I've ever done was about five years ago. I got fifteen fifty each for muskrats. That's the best I've ever done. Yeah. But I didn't have many that year. Uh, probably the best I've ever done when I had a lot. Uh, I had several hundred. I think I had like six hundred one year, and I got and I averaged seven ninety five a piece for them. Yeah. And that was pretty doggone good. So then after that, uh, and I'd been 
I'd been trapping under the ice and I was, I had clear ice there for a while starting off. So man, I was hammering the muskrats. And I, every Sunday we lived at Wapalo, Iowa back then. And every Sunday there was, there was two different fur wagons come through Wapalo and stop and buy fur. So I would go every Sunday evening and watch them buy furs. So I wanted to try to hit the market at the peak. Well, when it got to what I thought was the peak, I waited till everybody was gone one night. And I went up to the, to the guy and I said, say, I said, I've got about 600 rats out at my house. And I said, would you be willing to come out there and buy them out there? Oh, no, he said, we don't do that. He said, we don't know you. You could thump us in the head and take no money. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> let me tell you who I am. And, and I showed him my ID. Of course, I was a game warden back then. And I said, I am a game warden. And I said, I ain't going to thump you. And uh, I said, I've got, some, I've got some good put up rats. So he came out and it was all said and done. I averaged 795. And boy, that really kicked me in gear. So then I went out and I started trapping even harder because, uh, man, that was a good fur check. Well, I'd been trapping, uh, first of all, on clear ice. And then we got some snow and then it got cloudy, made it a little bit harder. So now I'm back out there and I'm trapping and we've got some pretty good snow. And um, I just got going and I'm starting to hit pretty good. And we got a blizzard and we had a lot of snow and I couldn't get anywhere for a couple of days. Well, I learned a very valuable lesson then because I always used uh, the blocks of ice that I chopped out of to, to make my set, that was my marker for where my set was at. Well, after that blizzard gets over, I go back out to that marsh and I'm looking and there is snow in, at least knee high on the level and in the drifts, they're higher than I am. You think I can find all my, I, I had a hard, I spent all day, didn't find half my traps. Well, that taught me a valuable lesson. From then on, I always, used a marker, I'd use a, a willow, I'd stick it down, even trapping under the ice, either, we couldn't use colony traps back then, but I used almost all conibears and uh, I'd mark every set. So I do that now and it, I learned from that. So mm -hmm. I hope people are watching this, uh, mm -hmm. do that, mark every set, because you don't wanna go out there and have a hard time finding your sets. Right. Anyway, so, the price has fluctuated all these years. Uh, one year, I got $45 a piece for my coon, and they were green. They were skin, uh, but I didn't put them up. Well, that particular year, I rode with a guy to Forest in Illinois and sold them to Grant Grodenwald. And I had three, 400 coon at that time, all green. And he had put his coon up. I got $45 a piece for my coon and he got $55 a piece. Oh my goodness. $10, $10 per coon for putting them up. So that's when I started putting up, and I, ever since then I've put up my coon. Yeah. So you learn lessons as you go. And, uh, but now here's another lesson that uh, when, when Iowa first allowed us to take otters, um, the very first year we could have three otters. Well, uh, I sold those otters at our ITA for sale. I sold them green. And it was at that sale, there might've been 20 or 30 otters. And most of them were put up. My three green otters brought high dollar. And I never, never put them up. So the next year I had three more otters and I didn't put them up and I got high dollar again. So in my mind, I'm thinking, why go to all the effort of scraping and stretching those otters when I'm gonna get high dollar? And every year, uh, the last couple of years, I have not got high dollar, but you know, I've been close to high dollar. This year, I don't know what high dollar was because it didn't stay for the whole sale, but I saw quite a few otters sell for under the $29 that I got. Mm -hmm. So you think I'm going to put up otters? No way. Yeah. I, I did put one up last year for one of my sons. 
And uh, but why why should I go to all that effort? How so, many buyers did you have there roughly? Uh, we had we had I think we had thirteen buyers oh, this year, and that's does. yeah. We normally have right around anywhere from ten to fifteen. I don't know if we've ever had fifteen buyers, but you can always figure we've got at least ten. Uh, I think last year we had twelve. This year was thirteen. Um, so yeah, we have a good turnout. Yeah. Did, how about oh, how about muskrats? What were they doing on the muskrats? Poor, poor, yeah, buck and a half for put up rats. Yeah. Good rats. Yeah. 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 So, and I, one of my sons right now has got a couple thousand muskrats that he's sitting on. Uh -oh. He got them bailed up and in his freezer, but yeah, he'll sit on them. He yeah. he doesn't need the money, so he'll just sit on them and, and wait until it goes up. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like savings account or, you know, or whatever. It's it'll eventually, be yeah, worth, you know, yep. keeping them. Yep. So we learn lessons as we go. It's fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did, did I'm not you ever, drinking did, whiskey. I'm, drink, I'm not drinking whiskey. I'm drinking cider. Okay. I have my own orchard, <laughs> and, and 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 we make cider every year. And I usually have. Usually have some school kids come out and mm -hmm. get them to cranking and, and peeling and well we don't really peel anymore but we core the apples and and uh, it's it's a fun project and we get really good stuff out of it. Yeah. So, so you fr you freeze it freeze it then. Yeah. 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 I don't yeah. I don't pasteurize it. Yeah. Uh, everybody comes and helps. They take cider home, and then then we freeze and we usually end up with. I think last year we ended up like 30 or 40 gallons yeah. that we froze. This year we didn't have as much, uh, but it's good year round. It never goes bad. And um, because I'm not selling it, I don't have to pasteurize it or anything. Yeah. So it's good, good, good for you. Good for your body. Yeah. Did you raise the apples? Yeah. 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 I've got, I've got uh, 19 apple trees here. I got a son that lives a mile and a quarter from me and, and he's got like six apple trees at his place. Got another son that's got four apple trees at his place. So we've got we've got apples all around. Yeah, yeah. And peaches and pears and everything. Yeah. Do you you may uh, well we're off on a tangent. You you maintain those trees within with a spray schedule and all of that. Yeah, I'm not big on spraying, but uh, you do. The most important spray is what I call the dormant oil spray. Right. And that's uh, before the leaves start budding out. Uh, in fact, if the, the, the orchard people tell you the first warm day in, this, in March, uh, you want to get out there and spray because that's when the bugs will start coming alive and they're overwintering under the bark. So you want to get them killed. Mm -hmm. Dormant oil spray. And next, to me, the most important spray is is when the petals drop, yeah, because uh, you can't spray when the uh, when they're in blossom because the bees are pollinating. You don't want to right. kill the bees, right? So I spray an all-purpose orchard spray you know, when three quarters of the petals are gone, because that's when those insects go to that petal, and uh, that's when they get into the apple. Yeah, yeah. So. And then I don't do any more spraying unless I get those uh, Japanese beetles. Then I usually spray a uh, a, um, a soapy mixture on them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so enough on that. <laughs> so you want to hear a game warden story? Sure. Or a, two or three. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you a couple. First of all, uh, you know it's very rare for a game warden to. Uh, to go and write a ticket to somebody and have that person end up in jail for what they <laughs> did wrong, even if they're a very bad violator. But the very first time I ever had anybody thrown in jail, uh, it was early in the spring and uh, people were wanting to get out and go fishing. And so I'm out just moseying along the Des Moines River and I see a pickup truck parked yeah, and there's a little walk going down to the river. So I parked behind that pickup truck and I walked down just in time to see a guy cast cast a, a line out in the water. 
And I walked up to him, young guy, uh, and I, the state conservation officer, I said, I'd like to take a look at your fishing license. And he said, I ain't got one. And I said, really, is there any particular reason why you don't have one? And he said, well, I said, first of all, I couldn't afford it. But he second, he said, second of all, he said, I wanted to see if the fish were biting before I went and got a license. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to have to write you a ticket. And, uh, and so I wrote him a ticket and I said, you know what? Today is Tuesday. And in Van Buren County back in those days, they only held court one day a week and it was a Tuesday. So I said, if you want to take care of this, I said, we can leave your pickup here. I'll drive you into town because it's just about time that the magistrate's gonna, gonna open her office. And I said, I'll take you in there, get it taken care of, bring you back. So he agreed to that. So I drove him into town, walk into the magistrate's office, nobody else around. And uh, Donna Brueggemann was the magistrate. And Donna says, Mike, what do you got here? And then she addressed the guy, she knew the guy, this young guy. And uh, I said, well, this young gentleman here, he didn't get himself a fishing license yet this year. And she looked at him, she said, is that true? And he said, yeah. And she said, well, why didn't you? And he said, I didn't have the money. And she said, well, so she asked me, she said, have you got a ticket made out? And I said, yeah, here it is. So I handed it to her and she said, you're gonna plead guilty or not guilty? And he said, well, hell, I'm getting old guilty. So she said, one night in jail. <laughs> and then she yelled across the hall because the sheriff's office was right across the hall. That's where the jail was at too. Now this is Van Buren County. We're just just a few miles north of the Missouri border. <laughs> anyway, so she yells, Orville, come and get I got a I got a guy for your jail. So Orville comes over and takes him off to jail. And I I was flabbergasted. And I said, Donna, I said, don't you think I was kind of harsh for for no fishing license? And she said, I know that family. They have no money. She said, he'll got a good bed and he'll get a good meal. And she said, in the morning, Orville will take him out to his truck. So <laughs> I was just flabbergasted. But so here the guy got one night in jail for not having a fishing license. Well, then uh, about a year later, uh, opening day of pheasant season, which is also back then was the opening day of the trapping season. And um, I'm not getting going real early that morning because I know it's going to be a long day. Anyway, the, the, the shooting hours for pheasant was at eight o'clock. It was also eight o'clock is when the trapping season opened. So I'm le just leaving town and uh, it was just a little bit before eight. And a city policeman calls me on the radio and he says, uh, I've got a guy walking down the street here with a coon. He said, can you come over here? I said, yeah. So he told me where he's at and I drove over there and, and, uh, and that cop had been just patrolling the streets and he saw a guy walking down the street with a coon pelt and he stopped him. And the guy told him he got it last night. Well, that was before the season was open. So he called me and I, Went and anyway, I wrote the guy a ticket. And uh, anyway, uh, he ended up when he had, when he went to court, they threw him in, in jail for a day. I didn't know the guy's first time I'd ever seen him, and uh, he was just diddly bop, bopping down the street with a coon dangling <laughs> that he was going to take to his buddy's house because his buddy had a freezer, and he was going <laughs> to put it in the freezer of that guy's house. So. Anyway, so there was a guy that got one day in jail for carrying a, a coon. He, he admitted to killing it the night before and the season wasn't open. Well, <laughs> then uh, uh, another guy uh, didn't have a license and it was before the season was open and he got 10 days in jail from the same magistrate. So that magistrate, but the, the magistrate gave him now, now this was a, not not the one that put the guy in the fisherman in, in jail. This was a different county. And he, I had two counties back then. Anyway, uh, this was Jefferson County. Anyway, uh, he got 10 days in jail for no license. And 
he had a $25 fine for illegal possession of the coon. So, anyway, now that same magistrate later on that later on that season, uh, I got a guy with what we call a setup gun in Iowa. Uh, all guns had back then things change, but back then all guns had to be inside of the guy had to be unloaded and inside of a securely fastened container. In other words, a gun case. Right. And if it was a tie type, you had to tie it. If it was a zipper, it had to be all the way zipped up, whatever. Anyway, so I got a coyote hunter. Used to get a lot of coyote hunters with setup guns because they run around with their chasing coyotes, you know, and they want to be able to shoot them right out of their pickup as quick as they can. Anyway, so I take this guy in and he got a $25 fine. Well, no big deal for him. He just paid the fine. And uh, two months later, I got him out there again, same thing. So I take him back to the state magistrate. That time he got a $50 fine, okay? Well, the next fall, I got the same guy again. <laughs> and, and the same, in that, that particular county, Jefferson County, I had two magistrates. But this particular guy was in front of each, the same magistrate each time. So the first time he got a $25 fine, Second time, he got a $50 fine. This time, the judge hits him $100. Well, a month later, I got him again. <laughs> <laughs> this time, the judge threw him in jail for five days. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and he told him, he says, if I ever see you in here again, the next time, you're going to be in jail for 30 days. What did the guy say? Never saw the guy again. <laughs> I imagine not. But the guy, well. the guy... Yeah, I, the guy had had been had got tickets before I was there, before I was the officer from the previous officer. The guy had got tickets for the same thing, and after I transferred and left and went over to the Mississippi River, uh, the guy that followed me ended up getting the same guy again. But he got him in a different county, so I don't think he ever went. To, and the guy was an old guy, far you know he was ten fifteen years older than we were. And uh, anyway, he was a farmer and he had a lot of money. So yeah, yeah. He, just, he loved hunting coyotes. <laughs> but he, he was like a <laughs> habitual a, offender. Time for, for, for that. <laughs> so I, I don't know if they hit people like that out where you guys are from, but, and that's very unusual here too. Yeah. I, you know, Mike, back in the uh, 70s and 80s when coon prices were, crazy and everybody was out it didn't matter if they could if they had permission or not it was stuff was crazy in terms of anybody chasing for coons being probably the the biggest violation because obviously dogs don't know yeah. fences and and i i remember one uh conservation officer is what we call him here one that's one, our official title too uh, okay one one conservation officer saying that they just wish the coons were extinct. They, they were so tired yeah. of dealing with that. You know, just the constant yeah. phone calls and complaints and trespassing yeah. and just, it just you know, <laughs> they were over it. Yeah, I can remember, um, I got to think hard now, but what, think what year it was. Um, in 78, the fall of 78, in like, well, it was like November, we were going to run a flight one night looking for spotlighter. And we did a lot of flying at night for spotlighters. But this one particular night, we flew a 30 mile loop and we ended up with 31 spotlighters in like a six hour period of time. That was a record for us. Normally, you go out, if you're not running an airplane, if you go out and you get two or three spotlighters a night, that's that's a good night. If you're running the airplane, you might get five or ten spotlighters. But that night we had we had we hit the pay dirt that night. <laughs> so what were they spotlighting deer or were they what were they? No, this no, this was coon. Okay. They're spotlighting coon. And they and you're and that was illegal. Well, okay. think about what the prices were back in in 78. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of money. Yeah. 
it it created a lot of problems. Yeah, it did. Yeah, and and it, we and we got very little sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yep, very little sleep. So uh, I could probably tell you another another very valuable lesson, uh, and this is from a trapper standpoint, but also from a game warden standpoint. And I actually wrote a story about it, and for um, and it's published in my first game warden book. Um, and for your viewers, before we get done tonight, I'll talk a little bit about some of my writings. But in my first game warden book, I I wrote a story called um, Accusing. And what prompted that story was I was trapping on the Skunk River, and I had a partner, Jerry Garniopst. Uh, from Burlington, Iowa. He was a legend in the, in this neck of the woods. And Jerry and I teamed up and trapped together for six seasons, actually seven seasons. Anyway, uh, this was either our first or second year trapping the Skunk River. And uh, this particular morning, uh, Jerry stayed at my house and and then every morning we'd head for the river and we'd be wanting to put the boat, we trailered the boat back then. We wanted to put the boat in just at daylight. And we had a trap line ran about 20 miles down the river and then we'd come back up. Anyway, um, when we got to the river there at this particular access area, there's a real steep boat ramp. Anyway, there's a pickup sitting there and nobody around it. So we went ahead and put our boat in and we just got the boat launched and we're getting ready to take off. And I see a pickup pull in. And so I walked over there, three guys in the pickup. And I knew all three of them. And uh, one of them didn't have a really good reputation, but the other two uh, I knew as, as pretty uh, well-known and well thought of farmers. Anyway, uh, I said, guys, what are you up to? And of course, they knew me. All of them knew me. So they knew I was a game warden. And, uh, oh, we floated the river last night for coon. I said, really? Uh, and I knew none of these guys had coon hounds. And in my mind, I know they're spotlighting. And, and of course, that's illegal in Iowa. Anyway, uh, so I said, uh, so... I don't see any dogs here. So what, what's going on? Oh, no, there was another, another, there was four of us. And our fourth buddy, he got, he's got the dog and he's already left. When they got down to, they, they left a vehicle, they put in our boat ramp where I was putting it in and, and they floated down, but they left another vehicle and a trailer down at the other boat ramp. And so when they got down there, uh, he took off with the coon. He had like 22 coon, they said they got. Well, I knew they were spotlighting, uh, but I can't prove it, so I don't accuse them. It's a good thing. Anyway, so they went on their way and took off, and Jerry and I get in the boat, and we head down the river, and you had to go down about a quarter, quarter mile down the river before you come to our first set, and it's gone. The entire set's gone. Yeah. Now, I invented the set called the fish stick set, uh, and... Uh, you use two traps at every set. You use a re-rod stake and two traps at a, at a set. So there's two one and a half coil springs that are gone along with our stake and if there was any coon in it. That's unusual for us to lose a set. Go to the next one, it's gone. Now again, to make a long story short, we end up with 30 sets that are gone. And in my mind, it's these guys that have floated the river and spotlighted. They go along, they, they spotted, they saw that we had, and they took them. But I ain't got no proof. So what do you do? Well, you can go confront them, but they're going to deny it. So I just, I didn't. But in my mind, I'm almost 100, I'm not 100%, but I'm close to 100% certain these guys did it. Well, I never saw them again until the middle of the summer, I put on a, um, 
a, a trapping seminar at the district office and we brought in 30 or 40 youngsters and their parents and, and teaching some, tra some trapping stuff. And these guys show up and I had to bite my tongue to keep from accusing them of stealing those traps. But I bit my tongue and I didn't accuse them. Well, anyway, come the next trapping season, um, I was trapping without Jerry, but there was another guy who came from up, up the river from way down below and he ended his line where my line ended. And I'd see him a couple of times uh, when I was checking traps. Anyway, I'm going along and I, I got traps gone again. Well, I'm just beside myself. I don't know what, but I get home uh, late that afternoon and this guy, that the other trapper, and I knew him, he was the postmaster in a little town of Wayland, quite a few miles away. He called me. He said, Mike, were you missing any traps today? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was. And he said, well, I was too. And he said, you got any idea who it was? And I said, not really. And he said, well, I do. He said, yesterday afternoon, he said, I know of two young teenage boys, they're in high school. I know of two teenage boys that their mother dropped them off at, at the boat ramp where you put in at, and they floated the river for ducks. And he said, They've been in trouble before and they're, they're known to be thieves. So he said, and he told me where they lived. And he said, if you go visit them, you might be able to find your traps. So I called, I was the district supervisor. So I called the local officer for the area where I was trapping, Steve Messenger. And I called Steve and I said, told him what I had. And he said, he said, I wouldn't put it past them guys. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to change clothes. I'm going to get into uniform, even though I was on vacation. And uh, I said, why don't you pick me up at my house and we'll go wool them around a little bit. <laughs> so, 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 and they live clear out in the country. So we drive down there and walk up, knock on the door. And the dad comes to the door and uh, let Steve do the talking. And he asked if, the two boys were there. And the dad said, no, they're not here. What do you want with them? And uh, Steve said, well, there was some stuff missing on the river yesterday. And we, just, we knew they were on the river. We're just wondering if they know anything about it. About that time, saw those, I didn't know them, but saw two, two boys run across the room back behind the dad. And Steve saw it too and said, well, there they are. I thought you said they aren't here. Well, he said, I was trying to protect them. I didn't want them getting any trouble. So that tells you what kind of a family they come from. Well, anyway, so the day I finally got the boys to come to the come to the door and pulled them around a little bit, told them what we knew, and and uh, they finally fessed up. I said, well, I want them traps back. And they said, well, they, they had come outside and they said, if you and, you and Steve just stay right here, we'll go back to the barn and we'll bring them out. So they went, we did that. We stood there talking to the dad, kind of ticked off at the dad for lying for the boys. But anyway, uh, the boys come back and they threw down a whole pile of traps and mistakes. And instantly I recognized some of those traps from the previous year. All right. Yes. <laughs> so, so now I'm thinking, you know what, if I was, I was that close to being certain that those other guys had stolen all my stuff. And if I would have accused them, they, they would have been offended. Yeah, they'd have been mad. Who knows where it would have gone from there. But I would have made lifetime enemies. They would have never forgot that. Yeah. And like I say, two of those guys came from well-known and well-thought-of farm families. And they're still good friends to this day. I'm still good friends with them, but I wouldn't have been if I would have accused them. So let that be a lesson to me, to you, and to the viewers who's watching this. Boy, you make absolutely certain you know for certain before you accuse anybody of anything. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I was sitting I, for time. Yeah. Well, oh, we're good. Um, 
703. 703. So not quite an hour. I, I got a question on that story though. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, so what happened to the boys other than they just gave the stuff back or well, any sort of we uh in Iowa we've got a one year statute of limitation on misdemeanors. So we could have wrote them each a ticket for theft. And but they'd already been in some trouble. And they were getting real close to being, and I didn't know them at all, but Steve knew them, knew they'd been in trouble. They were real close to getting to go to reform school. So we dangled that one year of statute of limitation over their head. And we said, we're not gonna write you any tickets right now, but if you guys, we're gonna keep track of you guys in the whole law enforcement community, if we just, if you guys get into any kind of trouble between now and a year, we're going to file these tickets. And they didn't. They never got in any more trouble. So we, we never we never filed tickets on them. Yeah. They probably would have got a $100 fine uh, for the theft because that was what a misdemeanor was back then. Mm -hmm. But they were close to going to reform school as it was. So they might have ended up there if we'd have written, written the tickets. You got, you got any... Um present day history on those two boys or they uh i heard after they graduated from high school that they got into drugs and they got into some problems so no i don't know anything about them now i just just yes. a little bit of bits and pieces i heard after the fact yeah so, well, you know they, yeah. They, they were in trouble all their lives yeah. so what what kind of um have you had much dealings with conflicts between bird hunters, I mean, uh, dog hunters um, and trappers? I mean, that's always kind of a riff, as certainly was in the 70s and 80s. Um, it was a, not as much now, maybe, but back then, you know. Yeah, back then it was a big issue. Yeah. And uh, it seemed like, you know, back then we were fighting the antis, mm -hmm. but we were also fighting the dog hunters. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we haven't had any problems for quite a few years now, Yeah. but uh, we kind of joined forces. Uh, we've all, I was on the committee that developed our fur harvester education program here in Iowa. And, and we brought in uh, on our committee for our fur harvester education course, we had uh, Wayne Funky, who was representing fur dealers. He had a supply house also, but a uh, trap supply house, but he was also a fur dealer. So he represented fur dealers. Neil Bach was a well-known nationally snare man. Right. Uh, so Neil was representing the snare people. Mike Long uh, was a pretty active fur taker back then. So he was representing the fur takers of America. Uh, I was representing the DNR law enforcement. Um, Rick Good was the president of the Iowa Coon Hunters Association. So he was there representing the coon hunters. Anyway, um, that was probably the start of, of um, any, any conflicts between trappers and dog hunters. Mm -hmm. And as the years have progressed, it's just got better and better and better. And, and um, I think we've got a really good working relationship now. And and there's been some changes in our, in what we can do with the counter bears, you know, and, and um, we, we fought most of those changes, but some of them probably weren't as bad as what we thought they were. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we're in a good working relationship with the dog people and have been for quite a few years now. Yeah. And I, I think that's probably nationally pretty well that way too. I, I, th I think so. I mean, you just yeah. don't really hear that. Here, here, and you're like, you know, we once did certainly yeah. in that fur boom years. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, and a lot of times some of these laws in states that were um, very strict on their trapping regulations was actually, you know, the, I mean, the common line at times would be, well, the antis got in here and did that. And it was actually a lot of that was put in place by dog, the dog hunting community, got the yeah. trapping yeah. laws, you know very restricted, Tennessee being a good example. And um, fortunately, through the Tennessee uh, Trap Association, 
um, they have been able to um, get a lot of those laws so it's a lot more trapper friendly. But yeah, a lot of those laws from years ago, probably 60s and prior was more because of the dog hunters having the stronger um, voice with uh, yeah. either the, the DNR or the legislatures or whoever was making the laws, you know, so. Yes, yep, you're correct. Yep, yep, that's right. Hey, I'd mentioned earlier, but before we get done, I wanted to tell a little bit about my writings. In the last time when I was on here, uh, I held up and showed the first book I ever wrote, which was called You Gotta Be Tough. And that was about my time in Vietnam. The second book I ever wrote was called Just Muskrats. And uh, it's about my, uh, I started trapping in 1960 and I started with muskrats and I'm still trapping muskrats. And got three muskrats my first year, my best year ever, I don't know, several thousand. But that particular year I got 1,132 in 10 nights. So, uh, and I, I attribute that to three things. One is the mus first and foremost, the muskrats were there. Number two, I had the right amount of equipment, the right kind of equipment and the right amount of equipment. And number three, I had the energy and the stamina to be able to keep up a strong pace for a long time. Well, so my methods, and I got to fine tuned where I can catch that kind of rats in a short period of time. And that's what this book that was telling people is what I do and the methods that I use for that. And it's not, a, it's not an expensive book. I sell that book for $10 retail from, if they get it from me. Uh, some of my distributors that have my books, I think they're selling it in that same neighborhood. Uh, and uh, it's been a good sell. It's not, a, it's not a heavy reading book. It just cuts down to the bare facts of, and it doesn't talk about mink or coon or anything else. Well, my second book, or my third book then was, was this one, The Adventures of Trapping with Jerry. And I had mentioned about Jerry. That's the guy that I was trapping with. And that guy was a, was a legend. And he was, uh, when I met up with Jerry, he was 65 years old and I was 30. He died in 1991. Anyway, uh, it's, it's filled with stories. Uh, and it's, it, it was an adventure trapping with him. We had a lot of fun. And just about every time he and I are in, were off trapping together, I'd end up with, I was all, always on vacation uh, as a game warden and I'd end up with some kind of a game warden situation that had to be taken care of. <laughs> and so those stories tell all that. Yeah. And it's fun. My boss, uh, one year, Jerry and I were we were gone for two weeks, sleeping on the ground in uh, over at Lake Rathbun. Ended up making a huge, big, super high profile commercial fishing case on Lake Rathbun. Guy's taken 10 pound walleyes <laughs> in trample nets. Would have never got them, except for the fact that I'm out there sleeping on the ground and I heard them in the middle of the night. These guys were good at what they were doing. I mean, they, they came from commercial fishing families. They knew how to fish. They were good at it. But they also knew how to bend the law or maybe break the law. <laughs> and, and they knew what they were doing. And, uh, and they avoided detection for a lot of years. But because of my being out there trapping, got them. <laughs> anyway, that was a good case. Yeah. So that was my third book ever written. Fourth book was uh, the Game Warden Case Log that uh, I advertise and and I started writing those stories for the Fur Taker magazine. And uh, so that book's been very popular. And then I continue writing that every month. Um, for the people that are watching this, this podcast, if you're not a member of the Fur Takers of America, and even if you're not a trapper, if you wanna read some of these game warden stories, uh, join the Fur Takers of America and you'll have access to those stories every month, a new story every month, but also you can buy these books uh, 
from the distributors in there that are listed as handling my books. If you don't, if you don't want to buy them directly from me, you can get them from uh, a distributor. And then uh, there's a continuation of that, volume two. And this one I do not sell, but this one I did recently. That's uh, the history of the Iowa Trappers Association. And uh, right now I'm currently uh, in the wind down stage of writing the history of the fur takers of America. I've been at that now for uh, a couple of years and I can finally see the end in sight. And I kind of made a commitment to have it out by convention time, which will be in June. Uh, it's gonna be in Wisconsin this year. And um, there's, there's parts of it that I won't be able to get done by then. So I have appealed to another very good writer, Dave Hastings, to, uh, to add to and to co-author this book with me on the history of the Fur Takers of America. Dave has consented to that. Uh, we're gonna meet up here in, in a couple of weeks and, and uh, exchange a bunch of information. And, and he has lent me boxes. I mean, crates full of historical data that I've been pouring over. And um, I'm through it now and I'm gonna get it back to him so he can do his part of it. But my part is just about done. Anyway. Yep. Just trying to put a plug in for the fur takers. <laughs> yep, we, we uh, well, that that's appreciated, and and that we've mentioned it before. That's a monumental task, the fur takers of America you know, history. Um, yes, it's a huge task. Uh, Fifty plus you, years. You just, yes. Yeah. And you discover stuff that uh, first of all, there's stuff that's that will never be printed because it doesn't need to be. It's ancient history, you know, there was conflicts uh, and that doesn't need to be brought forward anymore. So that, that won't be in the book, those conflicts. There, there might be an allusion to some conflicts if, it, if it's part of the story, that is part, part of the important history. Um, but also I have discovered uh, there, you know, we have the Hall of Fame Award. Uh, there is a guy that should have, should be in the Hall of Fame and he's not. I just double checked today. And he was a member of when the Fur Takers started in 1968. And he was our very first uh, general organizer, Ed Meredith. And, um, and I just discovered today that, um, that he is not in the Hall of Fame and I'm gonna write up a nomination for that. Um, and I'll put my reasons in there why, but when the book comes out, people will, will see that he is well deserving of that award. And I'll get that done and get it mailed off to whoever I need to mail it off to. But uh, when, I, when I did the history of the Iowa Trappers Association, I found the exact same thing. Two people that were monumentally uh, responsible for the growth and, and the organization of the Iowa Trappers Association, Katie Blackman and um, Lance Olson's dad, um, Bob Olson. Bob Olson and Katie uh, Blackman, just monumental and very, very important. And they were not in our hall of fame. Mm -hmm. So after writing the book and recognizing that they hadn't been recognized, uh, I nominate them and they are now in our Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see Ed also the same way. Well, we'll see if it works out. It'll be up to whoever's committee on that committee, but I'll definitely get my part done. I, actually, I'm the chairman of that committee, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was thinking, scratch my head like that. I, I would have figured that out pretty quick because I was, <laughs> when I get it written up, I'm going to, I got to mail it to somebody, so you'll get it. So, and, and for, for, for those of you that are Fertaker members, that's, with the deadline for nominations for the various awards is April 15th. So all of you do some, do some uh, heavy thinking. Yeah, heavy thinking and, and get those nominations in. So yeah, yeah, yep. appreciate that, Mike. So. Well, hey, now, Mike, do you yes. need um, me to send in my bio and my picture to you so you can write about me in the Fertaker? 
<laughs> well, you know, you know hey, there's only so start much, somewhere. <laughs> there's only so much room in these, in this writings. I mean, I thought maybe you know, unfortunately, there, that that does that does bring up a really good point. Uh, the books, um, the 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 more content in the book, the higher the price of the book sure. when you're publishing. In the same way with pictures, the more pictures you have in the book the more the cost of the book is. Um, I have been stingy on a number of pictures in my books because of the cost. Um, and I'm gonna be that way with the history of the fur takers also. However, there are some pictures that I would like to have. The most, the one I'm most looking for and I've been unable to find uh, print quality is I want, cause I've done a whole chapter on the Fur Takers College, mm -hmm. and uh, I've written that. I, I'm pretty satisfied with that chapter, but I want to have a picture to go along with that chapter of the very first class. And uh, there was a picture published in the December issue of the Fur Taker magazine of 1980 of that first class. But back then it was a newspaper type uh, publication and it's not high print quality. Mm -hmm. Somebody took that picture and I've talked to Major Boddicker because he was very involved with it. And he thought he knew where it was. He thought he had a copy, but he didn't. Uh, I have not tracked that down yet. I also know that Tom Krause, uh, Tom was in that first class and Tom was the editor of the um, uh, Trapper and Predator. It was just called the Trapper back then. Right. Tom was the editor, and he had the same, almost an identical picture in the Trapper. Well, the Trapper was a was a newspaper type, also. I've got those pictures there, but I really need either an original or a something better than newspaper. Right. Uh, I have not been able to get. I haven't put a lot of effort in getting in touch with Tom. But if I could get a hold of Tom, I would ask him. And I would not surprise me if Tom's got uh, from clear back then, if he might have one. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one that I've been looking for. Uh, Bill Parks hasn't been able to come up with one yet. And I had, I had a whole suitcase full of pictures and notebooks that Bill Parks lent me for this book. And it wasn't in there, but Bill's got other stuff too. But so far, he hasn't been able to find it. Um, but that's one I I feel is pretty important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Yep. Hmm. It's got to be out there somewhere. Yeah. Well, yep. if anyone's be. listening, yep. they yep. might know something. It should be. all of us. Yeah, it should be. So, hey, yep. Um, it, I guess you were in you were in the southern Iowa. Did so? Did you ever have any dealings with uh, Ludi Shetta? Oh yeah, yeah. I knew Ludi. Uh, I dealt with. I sold Ludi fur clear back in uh, in the sixties yet, mm -hmm. and up through the set. I I sold Ludi fur not a lot of fur, but I sold him fur uh, clear up until he was no longer in business, mm -hmm. and then after he and his wife were gone. Actually, uh, we had the, they had an auction of all of his stuff before he was dead. And I went to that auction, I bought a lot of stuff. Yeah, I've still got a lot of looty stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good yeah. guy, good guy. He was so iconic. I mean, you know, you have to be a little bit older to remember him, but uh, he was always present at the Trappers conventions and, and yeah. um, um, Everyone knew who he was. He he, he was uh, um, very well known. Yeah, you know we could we could we could talk some of those names all night. Yeah, uh, I got a guy coming from Wisconsin next week uh, because I I collect um, J. Curtis Gregg, mm -hmm. one of the top mink trappers in the whole nation. Clear back in the '30s, he used to he used to write for Hunter Trader Trapper. Right. And a uh, fur fish game at the same time period that Bill Nelson was writing. And uh, anyway, Jay Curtis Gregg and and I collect 
any any of his writings. And I've got a lot of extras. Well, there's a guy in Wisconsin that found out that I've got some extras and he's coming down next week to, uh, he's got some extras too. So he might have something that I'm looking for that I don't have. Yeah. So we're going to do some wheeling, dealing and swapping. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I know a lot of those. Uh, I never personally knew J. Curtis Gregg, uh, uh, Bud Hall. Yeah. Bud Hall is another well-known mink trapper. Uh, Marvin was his real name, Marvin Bud Hall. And he just lived like 30 miles north of me when I lived in northern Iowa. Mm -hmm. And um, I was invited one time to go to Bud's house uh, to view. He had like 50. I don't know if it was 15. I, I always say 1,500. But he had over 1,000 but under 1,500 red fox that he trapped that year. And another fur dealer that I sold my furs to, I was in selling him the fur. And he said, say, Mike, he said, you want to go with me up to Bud Hall's place? Uh, in a couple of days, uh, he said, Bud's going to be selling his furs. He said, I'm not going to buy them. But he said, I want to see that that huge lot of red fox. And I lived right on the way. And he said, I'll stop and pick you up. And I said, nah, I don't want to miss work that day. Well, I should have taken a day off yeah. uh, because uh, I missed my opportunity there. Yeah, yeah. And he was he was super well. He's he's also in the Iowa Hall of Fame. Yeah. Anyway, I, I remember I remember his name very well. Uh, Don Beerman. I think I don't know if we talked about him last time when we had the podcast or not. But yeah, I knew Don. Yep, yeah, he's pretty Don. well known. Yep. Yep. So. And look at uh, Ardell Graw. Yeah. You know, Ardell just called me in October, and, and I'm on the road. He calls me, and we're chit chatting about some guns. And he was he was he was in poor health. But he was still, in his mind, he's wanting to get out there and calling some coon, and he's picking my picking my brain about calling coon because I've done three coon calling videos, and uh, and and now he's dead. He's gone. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's he sent me some traps, not some traps. He sent me a collector trap, oh, probably five or six years ago. Because uh, he knew I collected traps, and he sent me one that he got from a guy from New Zealand. And uh, he said, "I bet you don't have this in your collection, but you do now because I'm going to give it to you." And he did. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. he was a good guy. Yeah. You got any? You got any final thoughts, Mike? Well, I think uh, if if your viewers. Uh, if you get a lot of good comments back, we could do it again. Okay. I could okay. tell a few more game warden stories. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of them pop into my mind right now. If you got a couple minutes, I'll tell you a quick one. Okay. And I, I, I named it, I call it Snickers. And, you know, uh, we eat things sometimes and you see it and you think, hey, is that going to be any good? But if you don't see it and you eat it, now, without seeing it, uh, sometimes it's pretty good. Well, uh, my neighboring officer on the Mississippi River, Irv Jennings from up at Muscatine, called me one afternoon. Mike, I'm going to need some help tonight. Can you come up here? And I said, yeah. What do you got going? Oh, I said, got some commercial fishermen that are coming up, coming up too close to the dam. He said, I've been getting a lot of complaints about them. So he said, come on up. He said, we'll go up. They're supposed to show up just after midnight. And he said, uh, we'll lay on it up there and and we'll catch them when they come up. So I went up and ate supper before I left, took off, drove to Muscatine, Iowa and hopped in with Irv and we hop in his boat and we go way up and we get in behind an island, hide the boat up there and, and we sit and we wait and we wait. And it's a super dark night. There's no, not a cloud, no, no stars, no nothing. Uh, it's dark. Anyway, uh, Got to be midnight, the guys never showed up. Got to be one o'clock, they didn't show up. Two o'clock, they didn't show up. <laughs> About three o'clock, Irv said, God, she said, I'm getting hungry. He said, did you bring anything to eat? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, well, I got a war bag with me. And he said, I got a six pack of Snicker bars in there. He said, you want a Snicker bar? And I said, yeah, I could use one. So again, in the dark, no lights. You never use lights at night. We were, we were really good at that. Anyways, so he hands me a Snicker bar. And man, I'll tell you what, after 
sitting out there all night eating that snicker bar. It was good. So we stayed until daylight. Those guys never showed up. Well, it's almost a mile from the dam down to the, down to back down to the uh, Muscatine. So we just cranked up and we're just getting going and he throws me another snicker bar. And of course it's daylight now. So I open up that snicker bar and it's full of little tiny holes. So I break it open and it's full of worms. Oh, and I said, no. Irv, the snicker bar is full of worms. Well, so he looked at his and it's full of worms. Well, he had a six pack. So, <laughs> you know, a package of sticks of those snicker bars. Those two had worms on them, all crawling throughout them. So we opened up the other two and they all had worms. <laughs> so oh, no. it's, it's, uh, <laughs> the ones we ate at like three o'clock, man, oh, were they man. good. <laughs> That's some so, extra protein for you. If you don't see what you're eating. <laughs> it was, it's just fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it's kind of a funny little story there. But So sometimes when I see something that I, I don't like the looks of, if you just close your eyes and eat, it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike. We appreciate it once again for being on, sharing the stories, and we'll do it again. Yeah, we'll we'll, okay. we'll, do, it. we'll do one next season or or two next season or something. So but whenever you're ready, just give me a holler. We sure appreciate it. And, we, and if we don't talk to you, we'll definitely see you in Wisconsin in June. Oh yeah. Yep. Looking looking forward to it. So it'll okay, be, we'll see you then. Be fun. So all right, Mike. Take care. See you.